Our next speaker uh, is Clive Thompson. Clive grew up in Toronto, went to school there right in the 70s and 80s as uh, these things called uh, computers were coming around and he got interested uh, in those, even though at that point he was uh, studying poetry and political science. He's a musician as well. He became a magazine writer in uh, the 90s, uh, and now he's one of uh, the world's, how about that? The world's prominent technology writers, not only about the inventors of the technologies, but about how all of us use those technologies uh, every day, sometimes unpredictably. He writes for the New York Times Magazine, for Wired, for Smithsonian, and these aren't little pieces, they're thought pieces. Uh, he also is one of the longest running bloggers uh, around. He began not even, I don't even know if it was called blogging in, in those days, uh, around 2002, uh, a blog called Collision, Detec Collision Detection. Uh, and so, uh, using the internet, I actually went and found one of his earliest blogs from September of 2002. Uh, and he was here uh, in Boston at that time. What was it called? What was the fellowship called at MIT? Knight Fellowship. The Knight, the Knight Fellowship. Uh, and he wasn't supposed to be doing journalism, but he did this thing called a blog, which at that point wasn't defined as journalism. And uh, so uh, he, went to, he went to hear uh, Mark Rosheim give a lecture at MIT about the notion that maybe da Vinci had designed something that looked like it might have been the first computer. It was a robot. And uh, in his first blog, he said, Rosheim spoke at MIT today and totally fried my noodle. So here, the author of Smarter Than You Think may fry our noodle. Mark. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming out uh, so early in the morning. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, as this slide says, I'm Clive Thompson. I am a reporter. I write about how people use technologies in their everyday lives to think. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about one of the big trends that became obvious to me as I was writing this book, as I was talking to dozens of people around the country and around the world. But I'm going to actually begin with a, a little story about myself uh, back at South by Southwest. Um, I was down to South by Southwest in the spring, and I was going to do a presentation. And in the middle of it, I was going to have a slide that mentioned the writer uh, G-O-E-T-H-E. But I realized with panic about 10 minutes before I went on stage that I had no idea how to pronounce that name. I mean, I had seen it written several times, but I'd never actually heard it said. And so I was going to make a complete idiot out of myself on stage. And so I, I tried, well, how am I going to solve this problem? You know, I need to get some advice from people. So I went on a Twitter, and I, um, I pulled my phone, and I wrote this tweet. I said, you know, I'm about to go on stage at South by Southwest and mention G-O-E-T-H-E. How do you pronounce it? I'm pretty sure I'm mangling it right now. So. You know, I have a few thousand people following me, and thankfully, a bunch of people saw this at the corner of their eye, and they started offering some suggestions. You know, I got, um, I got um, a guy I know in Washington said, you know, I'd go with Goethe, and he gave me a link to a YouTube video so I could listen to it. Um, and then even better wisdom started coming out of the crowd, because Gideon Litchfield, he's actually a German speaker. He said, you know, you, ha you have to, it, it's Goethe with a, with a silent R, like in the British. And so I started getting some really good wisdom here about how to do this, and I started to feel confident, you know, that I could, I could say this on stage. But, you know, Twitter being Twitter, people just started also just hassling me, you know. And my friends were, like, you know, writing jokes, like, it's, it's Gouda, you know. Or someone said it's pronounced YOLO. Uh, Jill Junger, who's a, 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 an architect I've met online, said, uh, pronounce it so it sounds completely wrong in North America, and then you know it's right. Someone also said, it's, uh, so it's not on this slide, it's, pronounce it so it sounds like you're about to hork up something nasty, then it's correct. So, um, so I got this kind of combination of good advice and sort of jokes. And, uh, and this is really what I want to talk about today, which is um, what happens to the quality of our thinking as we begin thinking out loud, as we begin talking about the things that we're wondering about, or the things we're seeing, or the things we're reading, and getting feedback from other people. Now, uh, in one sense, like, this is a now common behavior for many people. I mean, I think, hopefully, there may be people tweeting about what I'm saying right now uh, in the audience. We're accustomed to writing a lot, to talking to people, you know, discussion threads on Instagram, emails to folks, 
you know, threads inside boards on Facebook. But one of the things that when you talk to scholars of rhetoric, they'll tell you is that this is an incredibly weird transition in modern life. Because if you go back before the internet, the average person wrote absolutely nothing. I mean, they finished high school, they finished college, they wrote some papers for their, for their teacher. But after that, they didn't write anything down for the rest of their lives, unless they had a job that required they do so. Like if you were a journalist or you, know, you were a, a lawyer, the average person didn't write very much. I actually tested this theory out by calling the one person I know who's completely and utterly offline, which is my mother in Northern Ontario. She's never used a computer, she hasn't had a type, she's never been online. So I said to her, you know, when's the last time you wrote something like a paragraph in length? Um, and the phone went dead, you know, she didn't say anything at all. And so I was like, are you still there? She's like, yeah, I'm just thinking about it. And so I said, well, let's narrow it down. Have you, have you written anything longer than a, a grocery list in the last year? And she said, no. And I said, well, what about the last you know, 10 years? And she thought about it and she said, no. And I, so we went on this archeological expedition to try and figure out when the last time she'd written anything, a paragraph in length. And it turned out to be a, probably in the 1970s when she was writing letters to family, to family members at Christmas explaining what had happened. And that got killed off by the long distance phone call. So, so we've, we've had this transition from people writing almost nothing in their everyday, everyday lives to writing tons. And I, I actually talked to some data scientists to try and figure out how much you know, do we actually produce on a daily basis? You know, if you were to look at email, text messaging, instant messaging, everything, and we came up with a figure of 3.6 trillion words per day. That's, that's the global output of how we're externalizing our thought. That's uh, equivalent to the, to the entire library of Congress. Now, these are not all good words, right? I mean, you know, I think anyone who's been to the, you know, a discussion thread at the bottom of your average newspaper has seen how dreadful uh, some human online conversation can be. Um, but the stuff that's good, whether it's 10% or 20%, whatever percentage you pick, is larger than any other form of human expression in the past. And what particularly interested me as I talked to people was how it transformed the way that people thought, what was happening inside their heads when they knew that they were going to be talking to other people who were going to talk back to them. Well, what, if you talk to psychologists, they'll tell you that the first thing that happens in that situation is what's known as the audience effect, which is exactly what it sounds like. When you go in front of an audience, you suddenly stiffen up your spine a bit. You try and be a little smarter. You try and be a little clearer. You try and be a little more persuasive. It's sort of the effect that I'm feeling right now in front of you people. I mean, this is, this is, I, I'm, I'm trying to bring my A game. This is not, I'm not this coherent at the breakfast table, right? And so every time people start talking online, you will find that this happens. There's, there's been studies that have been done with um, college students where if you take the, the paper they've written for their, for their teacher and say, okay, we're going to put this online now so your peers and everyone around the world can read it. And they'll suddenly panic and rewrite it 40% longer with longer sentences and a more complex vocabulary because they're worried about looking stupid in front of other people. So this is the audience effect, and it happens over and over again. The other thing that people would tell me when I talked to them is that the act of writing down what they were thinking, even at the length of a tweet or a text message, forced them to think about what it is they were actually trying to say. And you know, poets have talked about this for years. You know, the act of writing something down transforms, that's when you realize what it is you're trying to say. Or as, as Cecil Day Lewis, the poet, said, you know, we don't write in order to be understood, we write in order to understand. And I live in New York, and I'm kind of nosy, so I've seen this in action. I'll be on the subway or on the bus, and I'll, I'll see someone pull up their phone, and they're writing like a tweet or a text message, and I'll sort of look over their shoulder. And you can see them doing this very iterative process. They'll write like 10 words, and then they'll erase eight of them, and then they'll write another 10 words and erase five of them, and they'll sort of go back and forth for four minutes writing a single text message or a single tweet. And then I'll, I'll ask them, I'll say, so you know, what's going on? Why are you spending three minutes writing 14 words? And they'll say, well, I want to get this right. And also, I'm trying to figure out what it is I'm trying to say. So over and over again, as we externalize our thought, these, these crystallizations happen. And the next thing that happens, and people have told me this over and over again, is that by going online and talking about the things that they're interested in, they're wondering what they're worrying about, they run into the other people who actually care about those exact same things. Now, everyone has some weird thing they're thinking about, they're wondering about, that no one around them cares about, and they find their strange tribe online. The scientists have a, have a name for this. They call it the theory of multiples, which is that ideas and concepts occur multiply to disparate people around the world. I mean, scientists learned this the hard way a couple hundred years ago because they would, they would labor to sort of figure something out, like the mathematical prediction that Uranus existed, and put it out there, only to discover that someone in Stockholm had put the same thing out two months earlier. And over and over again, they would discover this phenomenon of multiples. And that's why scientists 
hit upon the scientific method of publishing everything that they're working on, to get it out there to think in public so they can not only correct their errors, but they can discover the other people that are working on the same thing they're working on. They can learn from each other. And so this happens all the time as we start externalizing our thinking. And some really remarkable things happen. Like this, this is a great story. This is Oria Colo. She is a, a, a Kenyan blogger. She was trained uh, at Harvard in law. She went back to Kenya, and she got very interested in the political and economic ferment in Kenya. It's a very dynamic country. It's also a very corrupt government. And so she started a blog, and she started writing about this stuff, and she felt the audience effect because a couple of thousand people would show up and read what she was, what she was posting. And she felt like a responsibility to be smart and to give them interesting things to think about. And so she got a really nice to and fro going with this blog, and that became very important in 2007 because Kenya had an election that was widely regarded as being completely rigged. The government just rigged the election. But the electorate had finally gotten sick of this. So they, they, uh, they, they started protesting at the polls. They started complaining. And the government cracked down very violently. They not only cracked down violently, they shut down the media so no one could hear about what was going on. In fact, the only way you could hear what was going on is if you looked at blogs like those of Oria Colo, because she was writing about this stuff. And she was, she was in dialogue with her audience. They were emailing her and texting her you know, with news of what they had seen at the polls, uh, uh, reports of violence and oppression. And she was trying to get as much on her blog as she could to sort of get a, like a public record of what was happening. But it was kind of exhausting. She'd spent hours and hours and days working on this. And in the middle of this, she, she thought, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And because she was accustomed to thinking out loud and thinking in public, that's what she did. She just wrote a blog post. She said, you know, what if we had, you know, sort of a Google Maps mashup where anyone could put up a, a map of the region, and, and anyone who knew something could put a pin on the map saying, here's what's happening. And so, you know, because multiples exist and because she was thinking out loud, you know, lo and behold, a bunch of other nerds that were reading this that were also interested in Kenya and in crisis politics said, you know, we've been thinking about the same thing, and, and actually we think we can make this happen. So they got in touch with her, and within 48 hours, they created this tool. It's called Yushahidi. And it's, that's the Swahili term for testimony. And it does exactly what she was talking out loud about. It allows anyone in a crisis to put up a Google Maps mashup that allows anyone to sort of just put a pin on the map saying, here's what's happening. You're looking here at this picture. This is Haiti. This is Haiti after the earthquake four years ago. Within a few hours of the earthquake happening, some folks in Boston put up this map. And within a couple of days, 2,000 people every day were posting what was happening in Haiti. They were posting where they were stuck, where they needed help, where help was available, where they needed water, where, where water was available. And this rapidly became such an amazing crowdsourced form of information that the United Nations and the US Army found that it was better than their intelligence. They were relying on it. That's how great this, this was. And Yushahidi has been used over and over again. Anytime there's a crisis, you'll find someone putting up a map to collect information. So this is like, this is a really great idea. This is a world-changing and life-saving idea. But it wouldn't have happened if Oria Cola wasn't in the habit of thinking out loud and getting her ideas out there so that other people could be exposed to them and react to them and that multiples could be resolved. The other thing that she discovered and everyone that I've talked to discovered is that the theory of weak links begins to apply once you start externalizing your thought. Now, weak links is, is a sociological term for what type of people you know. Sociologists sort of break the world into, into two buckets. There's, there's strong ties and there's weak ties. Now, the strong ties are the people you know really well, your, 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 you know, your best friends, your family, the people you see you know, all the time. There's not many of them. There's only a few of those people. And the weak ties are people that you don't know very well at all. There's someone you sort of see once or twice a year. Maybe they work in your company in a, in a far off area. It turns out, though, that those weak ties are incredibly informationally important to our lives because they, they bring the new information into our lives. When Marshall Granovetter, a sociologist, asked people, how did you find your new job? He discovered that the people who'd found the best jobs, the ones that they, they liked the most, the ones that paid the most, had all heard about them from a weak tie, from someone that they barely knew. And that's because your close friends know the same things you know. They're not going to surprise you with any information. But the weak ties, the people that are far afield, they're going to surprise you with the new information. And so it's good to get in touch with them. Now, this used to be kind of hard to do, but it happens all the time now, as Oria Cola found out, and as people find out all the time when they begin externalizing their thinking and exposing it to other people. And so everyone in, in, their, in their hobbies, in their sub rosa uh, obsessions, discovers when you go online, you find your weird tribe. For me, one of my tribes happens to be guitar pedals. 
So I'm, I'm a musician, I'm a guitarist. One of the things I like to do is I like to build guitar pedals, take them apart and, and, and fix them. So I, I've found all the discussion boards online that are devoted to this. And now I'll go there and show up and there's someone from Moscow and someone from Brazil and someone from Toronto and all the people that care about disassembling guitar pedals. And this allows for some very interesting forms of collective thought. A couple of months ago, someone posted about this pedal. This is a 1960s a buzz around pedal. It's a famous fuzz pedal used by all the fuzz rockers of the 60s. But it's been, it's been out of issue for decades. And so if someone got their hands on it, it was broken. He couldn't get it to work. And he said, does anyone know what are the schematics for this thing? How does it work? And so lo and behold, because other people were listening and, and talking out loud and multiples and weak links were getting resolved, the sort of 14 people who had their hands in this pedal got together and spent a couple days collectively putting together a complete schematic for the pedal, the first time that this has existed in decades. This is a classic example of the sort of effects, the end effects, the collective thinking effects of public thinking that happen over and over and over again. Now, why am I telling you about, about crisis mapping and about guitar pedals here at a health convention? Well, it's because obviously one of the things that brings people together that they talk about a lot, that they externalize their thinking on, is healthcare. When, I, when my son was born, my first son was born eight years ago, one of the first things I wondered was, well, where can I go to talk about this? And I discovered this form, my wife and I discovered this form, it's called UB Mom. And one of the things you'll notice about it is it's a form for mothers, and, and a few fathers, mostly mothers, to talk about child rearing. And it's completely anonymous. You can probably see from this slide that there's no name attached to any utterance. And so, you know, this allows for some really fascinating expression. You know, you might expect that it's all just, you know, abusive and snark because of the anonymity. But the truth is, there is some of that. It turns out that new mothers have extremely black senses of humor. Um, but there's, but there, there's, there, is some, there is some joking and snark, but there's also people talking about things that they can't talk about with their strong ties face to face. Talking about, it could be just like hemorrhoids, like this conversation here, but it, it's often deep psychological things. People's, the strain on people's relationships, affairs they're having, affairs their husbands are having. Their worry is that they don't love their children enough or maybe they don't love them at all. These types of very, very difficult psychological issues. And one of the things that's really interesting that scientists have studied as they've, uh, scientists have found as they've studied UB Mom and these anonymous forums is that there's, there's a shocking amount of emotional support that comes out of the, wood, of the woodwork because when people expose their thinking about these delicate subjects, people respond. In fact, just a couple of days ago, there was a study that came out of Dartmouth that was looking at YouTube comments when people put up videos discussing their experience with mental illness. Now, once again, you know, YouTube has notoriously dreadful comments, so you would have expected that it would have been just a torrent of abuse and mocking. But they looked at 3,000 comments for 19 videos, and they found that only 5% of them had been flagged as abusive comments. The rest were surprisingly thoughtful. People reaching out and talking about sharing their experiences, talking about how to deal with this stuff, referring, referring saying, you know, don't just talk about this people online, go and talk to your doctor, get real medical advice. And they concluded this was a fantastic informal environment that was emerging online. Now, of course, when you allow people to talk online about whatever they want, you're going to allow them to do good things but also bad things. They can lead each other and they can mislead each other. And so one of the things I think that, that the world of healthcare is going to be grappling with increasingly is that this, this form of public thinking is not going away. People like it. They get benefits from it. But it's a difficult thing to manage in the healthcare environment. And so we need better tools. We need, probably need better environments and even just protocols for thinking about what are the situations that obtain when it's good to go online and talk openly about things? What are situations when you should engage in public thinking? What are situations in which you should engage in private thinking, when you should just mull things over yourself or talk about them with a single trusted authority, like a doctor or a healthcare official? Because I think as I've, as I've, I've tried to demonstrate today, there's enormous benefits that come out of public thinking. There's enormous benefits that come out of private thinking. As a writer much smarter than I said, Goethe, Sharing is more difficult than you think. Thank you very much for your attention. Clive, thank you.